Okay. I, I just want to make sure, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a weirdo, but since you said I am, you know, I'm already weird because I'm a Jesus freak. It's a good way. Amen. See, somebody standing up. Amen. That's good. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, let's just open up with prayer because uh, we've got we've got a road to travel on tonight. Let's pray. Dear Holy Heavenly Father, just thank you for your goodness, your love to us. Father, please prepare our hearts for this message tonight. I thank you for these people here that are just zealous for you, just wanting to, to get a message out of your word and be fed. And Father, I just pray that... Uh, Father, we can deliver today uh, just everything to glorify and honor you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. My opening. A lot of times you do a little opening to draw some interest so people don't fall asleep on you. So uh, hopefully nobody falls asleep. So we'll just we'll do our best. Um, we are preaching this morning on the absolute standard, the word of God. For faith, life, practice, the way, the way we live our lives every day as Bible-believing Christians. And I hope I can use that in, in the sense of all of us here, that we can all uh, classify ourselves as Bible-believing Christians as opposed to just the loose term Christian. Um, a Christian is just so uh, misused today in our culture, mainline Christianity, that um, everybody and their mom that just practices any kind of paganism as a Christian because they just have a set of morals and values. Right. And um, I'm trying to go a step further with you guys. That we're not just conservatives, guys. And I always get that all the time. Why, why can't we all just gather together and all conservatives just gather together? Well, we can't because um, we as Bible-believing Christians, if you're really a Bible-believing Christian, aren't going to agree with a lot of things conservatives believe if you believe your Bible. So there has to be a standard of truth, and it can't just be your own set of morals or the morals of society or the morals of your conservative group. It's got to be the Word of God itself. And I know it's a novel idea just saying that, but you'd be surprised how we want to identify ourselves with these groups. And we watch the news, we watch media, social platforms, and we line ourselves up with that. It's like, oh, I'm just like this guy. But then when you find out what this guy believes about the Bible and Jesus Christ, you're like, whoa, whoa, I don't believe all that. But you still line yourself uh, up with him because of his politics or because of his stand on morality or something. And, and it's, just, it's just a big no-no concerning the Bible. Um, you need to separate yourself. You need to line up all of the parts of your life with the Word of God. And in order to do that, you have to have a standard to trust. And if you can't, sta if you can't stand on the standard, then you're, you're really in a mess. You're really in a mess. So, well, why should I believe in the Christian God? Why should I believe in the Christian religion? Why should I believe in the Christian Jesus? Why should I believe in the Christian gospel? Why should I believe in the Christian Bible? Well, here's why. Just because you have a lot of religions out there doesn't mean there isn't one right one. Hmm. Just because you have a lot of wrong math prob or wrong math answers to a problem doesn't mean there isn't a right answer to a math problem. Just because there's counterfeit money in the world doesn't mean there isn't true money. Oh, does that come on, you with me? So there's false religions in the world, Psalm 96 5. Psalm 96 5. And you can turn there if you want. I'm going to fly through these because we've got a lot to cover. Psalm 96 5 states, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heaven. The Lord made the heavens. That's false idols. That's false religions. These are false gods. Well, you have a true religion. So you got a false religion, you got a true religion. Go to James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world according to what? You gotta have a standard. So even your religion has a standard. You say, oh, brother, man, I don't got religion. I got relationship. Well, you do. But you also got religion. But do you have the right one? Hmm. So you got false religion, and you have the true religion. You got false gods. Go to same thing. Uh, just another cross reference. First uh, Chronicles sixteen twenty six. It's just another cross reference to Psalm ninety six five. For all the gods of the people are 
idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So you have false gods and you have the true God. Jeremiah 10.10. 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. And an everlasting king at his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Your cross reference, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So God is the true God. He's the true God. So you have many false gods. There's only one true God. Just step back for a minute. Just, just, just think for a minute. Just, you know, okay, I understand. He's a true God. He's got true religion. Now, it, the key word is true. True. Now, my question to you is, is truth absolute? Now, remember, if you say truth is not absolute, you just made an absolute statement. Come on. If I say truth is not absolute, then I ask you, is it absolutely true? The truth isn't absolute? You have to affirm truth in order to deny it. That's, that is, it, there's no way to get out of it. It's circular reasoning. There's no way out of it. Truth is absolute and you can't get out of it. And God made you a foolproof way that you can know the right way. You can know who the true God is. You can know who the true Jesus is. We're, we're not even in the true Jesus yet. So let's, let's go ahead and start to preach on you already. False Jesus is Matthew 24, 5. Matthew 24, 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, true, we're talking tribulation time. I, I know that. But many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Well, I can show you in our day and age, uh, from the time of Christ all the way through, through all eras of time till now, that I've got a whole list of people claiming to be the Messiah. You got this guy that's from Miami. He, his name was uh, Jesus de Miranda. He claimed to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, for many shall come in my name saying I am Christ. Even though that's tribulation, you can still see the evidences of that all around you. So you have false Jesuses out there. How do I know which one's the right one? Is it, is it the Mormon Jesus? Is it the Jehovah Witness Jesus? Which Jesus is it? Come on, if, if truth is relative, meaning, well, my truth may be different from your truth. Well, well, I have different morality than you do. Well, then truth, you just contradict yourself in the definition of truth. Truth doesn't contradict. Truth is absolute. And you can only get a universal concept, abstract concept. Abstract just means supernatural. You can only get a supernatural concept like truth. From the standard of truth, which is God himself. Amen. Come on. All of us have truth. All of us. Are you lost today? You've got truth. You don't have the truth. You don't got the capital T truth, but you do have truth. So God leaves you without a witness. He, I mean, he leaves you with a witness. You got the truth within you. Now, Romans 1 says, for that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. You know, Romans 1 is dealing with lost people. How can a lost person say, wait, I know God, but I'm not glorifying him as God? You know what that tells me? Every single person that calls themselves an atheist isn't an atheist. They know God exists. That's the point. Why? Because they, now watch, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. For you to take truth, you have to know what it is. So they, they know what truth is and they hold it in unrighteousness so they don't have any excuse because they know what truth is. They know God. I'm, I'm saying they had saving knowledge of God. Come on, the devils believe and tremble. That don't save them, okay? I'm just talking about they know truth. They have light. John chapter 1, Jesus lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man's got light. So that whole total depravity of tulip is out of the door, right? Because every man's got light. You can't say everybody's totally depraved. That means you've got a choice as a lost person. You have, I, I'm not saying you don't have depravity. I'm just saying you don't have total depravity. Now, Ecclesiastes 7.29 backs that up. The Lord hath made man upright, but he hath sought out many inventions. Wait a minute. How? The Lord made man upright? 
wait a minute, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God is, is what people counter that with. No, no, oh, Ecclesiastes 7.29, John 1, all men have light, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Every man has faith. Every man has truth. Every man has light. Hmm, never thought about that. So nobody has an excuse. That's why the Bible says in Romans 1, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they, who? The lost people, are without excuse. He didn't say that Christians are without excuse. We, we've trusted Jesus. We don't need to have any excuse. Jesus justifies us. That's dealing with lost people having an excuse, which they don't have one. So if lost people don't have an excuse, why, why would any of us believe an atheist when he says, no, I really believe God doesn't exist? Why would you believe him? No, 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 no. You know God exists. You're taking the truth and holding it in unrighteousness. Now, I'm not saying that a person can't be in uh, culpable self-deception. I mean, they can really walk around in their depravity and just this cloud fog of iniquity and just say, no, nah, I'm just so depraved, I, I don't know. I'm just a reprobate, Romans 1. And all we do is reveal to them that they already know that God exists. It's, it's so, that's, why the Bible, look, that's why the Bible says Romans 14, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. The, the fool's not, it doesn't say the fool has told the Christian there is no God. The fool has told society there is no God. It says the fool has to tell his own heart there is no God. Why, why does he got to tell his own heart that? He got to try to make himself believe it. Every day he's got to tell his heart, 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 there is no God. Heart, heart, there is no God. Uh, I'm, I'm a fool, but I don't want to acknowledge I'm a fool because heart, heart, there is no God. Why is he doing that? That's why he calls himself an atheist. Every day he says there is no God. That's what atheism means. I'm an atheist. My whole worldview is atheism. What does atheism mean? No God. So he has to keep telling himself that. No God, no God, no God. Hey, what are you? I'm an atheist. Why do you base your whole worldview on, a, on what you consider a fairy tale? It looks like me standing outside of Walt Disney holding a sign that says, I don't believe in Mickey Mouse. And you you like, wow, this guy really has a... A, 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 a very rational worldview. He, he's an A Mickey Mouseist, and none of you would laugh at that. You'd be like, "Wow, you know, we can't, you know, we can't judge him. He's an A Mickey Mouseist." But then, but then we deal with these people serious. Are you, are you serious? Bible tells they're fools. They're fools. It's not name calling. It's the state of their intellect. They're fools. So, we have false Jesuses. And we have the true Jesus, John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the way to truth and the life. Does it say that? It doesn't say he's the way to truth. He says he's the truth. When, whenever you appeal to truth, you're appealing to my Jesus. You're appealing to my standard of truth right here in this Bible that's absolutely true. Now, guys, understand what we're doing right now? I'm trying to show you absolute truth here. Now, if you've got a concept like absolute truth, and you've got 4,000 Bibles in front of you, how do you know which one is absolutely true? you, you, you got to think about that. Now, False Jesuses, you have the true Jesus. And 1 John 5.20 is our, our also a cross-reference. We know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So who's the true God? It's, it's Lord Jesus Christ. He's the true God. Now, so we, we went over false religions, true religion. False gods, true God. False Jesus is true Jesus. Look at false gospels. Galatians 1 6. Galatians 1 6. I, mar I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Wait a minute, there's another gospel. Amen. Look at verse 7, which is not another. It's not another gospel, it's a fake. He, they're, they're calling it a gospel, but what is it? But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
Look, and then he gives you a warning. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then he, he, a second time he does it. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. You know, if you go to Genesis, if something's mentioned twice by God, the Bible says it's established. Hmm, interesting. Accursed, an accursed gospel. So that means there's only one way to get to God according to the gospel. Hmm, false gospels, one true gospel. Ephesians 1.13 in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What was, what was this gospel? It was the word of truth. That was the gospel of your salvation. The word of truth. We don't deal in false gospels. How do you know which one's the right one? The word of truth does not contradict by nature, truth does not contradict. Truth is absolute. So you can't have all these truths running around everywhere because they all contradict. You, you have to use deductive reasoning. It's, it's not that hard to do that. Truth is absolute. God made it really easy for all of us to know the difference between truth and error. So you got Colossians 1.5 as a cross-reference. Colossians 1.5 as a cross-reference. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So we're talking about the gospel, which is the truth. So there's one true gospel that can save your soul in this dispensation, church age dispensation. And that's the gospel of grace, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. That's how we get saved today. All right, so what, what do we just cover? We covered false religions, true religion. False gods, true God. False Jesus, true Jesus. False gospels, true gospels. Now, false Bibles. 2 Corinthians 2.17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. You say, well, this is still speaking. No, I believe it's dealing with anything dealing with the, with the words of truth. Can you corrupt those words of truth? Any of us can. Any of us have the ability to corrupt the word of God if we wanted to. But there's a warning. There, there's judgments for that. And be careful when you corrupt the word of God. There's judgments. Uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19 gives you sanction for what happens if you mess with God's word. You add or take away from his word. Okay, so you have a false, you have false Bibles corrupted. People can corrupt it if they want to. So if people can corrupt the Bible, which Bibles are corrupt? Come on, if you have whatever Bible you have today, how do you know if you have a corrupt Bible? If the Bible could be corrupted. Well, well you couldn't. Not if you say it's all the word of God. A little bit of deductive reasoning there, right? Which God deals in absolute truth. So you got a big problem there if you're not being objective in your decisions on the very word of God itself, if you're going to trust that good old King James Bible. Isaiah 34, 16. We have false Bibles, and Isaiah 34, 16 is the book we go to or the verse we go to for a true Bible. Isaiah 34, 16. Seek ye out the what? The book of the Lord and read. If I don't have a book of the Lord, certainly I can't read it. So right there, it, it says objectively that there is a book that's from the Lord that I can read. Where is that book located? Where is that book located? It can't be the NIV, the RSV, the ESV, uh, all the V's that are out there, plus the King James Bible. That's leaving me in confusion. And then all of those Greek texts all contradict each other. And then the translation to English contradict each other. What are you left with? Confusion. I, I, went, to a church of, I went to a church of God one time. I took the student, the, the Deland School of the Bible students out there to the church of God one time. We just went church hopping. Whether it was a cult, 
whether it was just a you know Baptist churches that are out there, I just took them out. And we, we all sat there. We weren't going to try to divide anybody. We weren't going to try to dispute anybody. We just I just said, sit down. We'll just keep our mouth shut. And we're going to hear what they teach. And I want you guys to listen to what these people are teaching, these people. And I want you to look at your Bible verses and see if they say what these people say they say. And you know what? They couldn't even, they didn't want to sit still. They wanted to try to correct them because there's like, man, they're pulling that out of context. That's not true. 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 Because God gave us the concept of truth. To be able to know the difference between truth and error. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by the good old King James Bible. But you know what was so confusing there? This guy's over here trying to deal with truth while he's preaching. He says, what does the NIV say? Okay, uh, um, anybody got an ESV? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Re re read it. Read the ESV. Okay, uh, anybody got an NIV? So they would read the NIV. And I'm just sitting there like, whoa, I am so confused. They all say something different. And if you, if everybody read those verses all together, just be mass confusion because they, they don't say the same thing. So you want cross references for a true Bible? Second Chronicles 24, 16, 2 Chronicles 34, 21, Jeremiah 45, 1, Genesis 5, 1, Exodus 17, 14, Exodus 17, 24, Exodus 17, 7, Deuteronomy 28, 58, Deuteronomy 28, 61, Deuteronomy 29, 20 to 21, Deuteronomy 29, 27, Deuteronomy 30, verse 10, Deuteronomy 31, 24, Deuteronomy 31, 26, De uh, Joshua 1, 8, Joshua 8, 31, Joshua 8, 34, Joshua 23, 6, Joshua 24, 26, 2 Kings 14, 6 book they could all be objective about even if it's the law you can be objective about it absolute truth leaves all of us without excuse god deals in absolute truth now let's let's get to the good part here go to matthew 4 go to matthew 4 in your bible matthew chapter 4 now, this is the temptation of Jesus Christ in the wilderness, okay? Now, look, just, just, just look at this. Um, I'm, you may even learn something you didn't know before. How about that? That'd be a good thing. Um, Matthew 4. So, I already know that. Okay. Then Jesus, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Not, 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 hung, not hungry, and hungered. That's the correct word. Um, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, What? It is written. I'm probably preaching to the choir on a lot of this, but nevertheless, Jesus Christ, the, the Word of God, John 1.1, 1, 1, is saying, It is written. He's appealing to his own words. It is written. Wait a minute. Is Jesus Christ appealing to his words in his first advent? Or is Jesus Christ appealing to his words when he was the eternal word in the Old Testament? That's the, He's going back to the Old Testament. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I want to show you something. You guys see the word word there? W-O-R-D. Now, Jesus Christ is the word, right? Come on, we can all agree with that. He's the capital W word. And there's a difference between the capital W word and the lowercase w word. The lowercase w is the literal scriptures, the, the spoken word, okay? Now, don't mix those two up like most people do. They, oh, I got I to gotta worship the King James Bible. No, you don't worship. You worship Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. So you have capital W word, lowercase w word. Now, look what it says right there. There's a lowercase w word, right? Now, Let's talk, remember this morning we talked about those italicized words? Remember that? When, when, you, when you go from one language, say Greek, New Testament written in Greek, from Greek to English, there's going to be some idioms that get changed, right? So what does the King James translators do when the idioms change? They italicize the words to show their honesty and integrity as they're translating through the translating process. That's honest. Don't you want an honest person translating the, the manuscripts? Sure you do. Well, how, 
Question to you, question to you. If you got another version today, how come those words are not italicized? You don't have any italicized words in your Bible. Hey, that's a challenge on the integrity of that translator of your manuscripts. First of all, they're using the wrong manuscripts. Second of all, they're not even honest in their translation process. Are, are, are you guys getting there? Now, now watch this. You say, well, why focus on word right there in Matthew 4.4? 4? Watch this. Go to Deuteronomy 8.3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. I want to show you this. Now remember, we're dealing with italicized words. Deuteronomy 8.3. Now watch this. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every... Is that word italicized? Word. That proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord... Doth man live? Wait a minute. That word right there is italicized. The word word is italicized. Jesus Christ quoted the italicized word. Hmm. Our King James translators were honest, weren't they? Hmm. See, that, that, that defeats the whole italicized argument. So, guys, you need to trust your Bible. Come on. The, the title of my sermon is, Can God's Word Be Trusted? But then you have to ask yourself the question, if God deals in absolute truth, which Bible is it? Well, this is the Word of God. No, 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 that's not. This is the Word of God. And everybody's in a mess. Because certainly, if we have to argue about versions, certainly that's confusion. Come on, if you have to argue about your verse, I have to argue about mine, that's confusion. God says, no, I deal in absolute truth. So there has to be a version out there that's absolutely true. Come on. If we deal in absolute truth, it's great. We can easily do this. It goes right to the King James Bible. But if we want to justify our stand, or maybe we have some background information that maybe other people don't know about, well, my mom, she really loves me, and she gave me this NIV as a present, and it's so meaningful. You, you bump into stuff like that. And it, it's tough to say, but you're like, well, you know, you, just, you need to get rid of it. You know, just get yourself the Word of God. Um, you're not going to go to hell. You can just keep it as a memento. Put it on a shelf. Just say, hey, mom bought me this. You're not going to throw it away. Just get yourself a King James Bible. You want to learn the word of God in truth. So Jesus Christ defends himself. Not with his mighty power, with, his, with the sword coming out of his mouth and just annihilating the devil with the sword of his mouth. Just with the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. That's what he... That's what he defends with. Huh. All right. So we did a little bit of that. Now. Now, Deuteronomy 4.2. You guys have got to turn there because I, I really wanted to cover some of this other stuff. So really quick, I'm going to hit this really fast. Deuteronomy 4.2. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. So add and diminishing. You say it's just that book, Deuteronomy. Only Deuteronomy you can't add or diminish aught from it. No, it's any revelation of God. He says my commands, anything that I command you. Did God command things later on after Deuteronomy 4.2? Yes, he did. So you not add or take away from anything. Deuteronomy 12.32, your cross-reference. What things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. See? Same thing. God, I am the Lord. I change not. Malachi 3.6. Ecclesiastes 3.14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Problem is nobody's fearing before God, so they keep adding to the word of God and taking stuff from it. And Revelation 22, 18, and 19, your final warning from John the Revelator himself. And from, you say John the Revelator, it's from God. It's from God. God warning you. Through John, he's warning you. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. He didn't say you're going to go to hell. He's just going to add the plagues written in this book. Um, verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his, now, now hear, hear it, part. Take his part out of the book of life. So we all got a part. 
No, he didn't say he's going to cash you into hell. He's going to take your part. Hmm, sounds like it's some inheritance going on there. Hmm, interesting. I ain't messing with my inheritance. What about you today? Are we all a bunch of little Esau's running around over here? I hope not. All right, so that's not just for the book of Revelation, by the way. Because if you say that's for the book of Revelation only, you got a big problem, friend. Then 2 Timothy 3.16 is only for the book of 2 Timothy. Hmm, that means all scripture is not given by inspiration of God. You got to be careful when you, when you take one verse and only apply it to that one book. Because God has 66 books and they're complete. They're complete. That's what Revelation 22, 18, and 19 is testifying to you. You have a complete word of God. Now, if, you, if your word of God is complete, is it trustworthy? That's the next question you have to ask. And you don't have a trustworthy Bible if you're saying all those Bibles out there are trustworthy. You are contradicting yourself. All right. So go to 2 Peter 1, 16. 2 Peter 1, 16. Let me try to put this on fifth gear here. 2 Peter 1.16. The Bible says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Wait a minute. This is, this is the revealing of the, of the Mount of Transfiguration right there. They saw the second coming glory of Jesus Christ. Praise God. We were eyewitnesses. I saw it with my own two eyes. How dare you say I didn't see it with my own two eyes. I was there. That's what he's saying. Now watch this. So eyewitnesses, right? Senses, seeing it with your own two eyes. Okay, keep reading. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wait a minute. They just said they saw. They saw the second coming glory of Jesus with their own two eyes. Now they're hearing a voice. Like, whoa, do we trust the voice? The voice from God himself. So I've got, I've got the eyewitnesses. I trust my eyes. I trust my eyes. I've got the voice. I trust what I hear. I trust what I hear. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with them in the holy mount. Look at verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Stop right there. I, they're, they're saying, I saw, I saw with my own two eyes the same coming of Jesus. I heard the voice from God himself. And I'm telling you guys, don't trust what you see. Don't trust what you hear. But trust the more sure word than what you see. The more sure word than what you hear. It will be the word of God. And if you don't have an absolute standard to stand on, you can't stand on this more sure word. It's not a more sure word. It's a fake word. We have a more sure word of prophecy. When do you do well that you take heed? I can tell you, I can warn you in love to take heed to the word of God because it's true. Every word of God is pure. I say that, I say that well meaning in my heart. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is any private interpretation. Certainly, if all those Bibles are correct, we've got a lot of private interpretations. But if you've got one, one standard of truth, you don't have a private interpretation, my friend. You've got the very word of God. You don't, you don't teach this book. You don't feed Greek and, and Hebrew into this book. You let this book teach you. People spending all their time trying to define words in, in the way that the Bible says they're not to be defined. And thus you come up with wrong interpretations. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. John 17, 7, 17. Jesus Christ himself believed the word was truth. Jesus Christ quoted the scripture. Remember in, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus Christ quoted a copy of 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 a copy. And he stood on it. Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 138. Psalm 138. Now I want to ask you while you're turning to Psalm 138. What name is above all names? What name is magnified above all names? Anybody know? Jesus Christ. Right? You can go to Philippians chapter 2. Right? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. 
And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No other name above the name of Jesus, right? Go to Psalm 138, start in verse 1. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word, thy word above all thy name. What's magnified above the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? What's magnified above the very name of Christ himself? It's his word. His word would mean nothing. If it was a bunch of lies, he wouldn't even be God. It's the word. Friend, you got the magnified word? You got the magnified word in your hand? Or you got a knockoff? Hmm. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. You couldn't say that if you had a book that you don't have every word of God that's right. Thy word is very pure. How can it be very pure? We just said it. every word of God is pure. How can it be very pure? Certainly you're in a bind now. The Bible says, Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. Certainly, I couldn't even use this judgment if you didn't have the pure word of God. Come on, if what we got is a copy of a copy that's corrupted, of another copy that's corrupted, of another copy that's corrupted, Isaiah 820 is meaningless. I, I can't judge you by that. No, everybody's got light in them. We, got, we all got Luciferian light in us today. Okay? We're all light. Everybody's light. No, it's not. It's not. I'm just being sarcastic there. No, no look, Jesus Christ brings light to every man, but you're going to get that light through the means of the Holy Bible. The right one. Hebrews 4.12. You guys know that one. The translation. Every time God translated, it was it got better. Every time, it, go in your King James Bible. Every time you read the word translate, translated, it was from something on one side. And when, when it, the, the translation finished, it was better. Hebrews 11.5. Hebrews 11.5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Was it better for him after he was translated or before he was translated? After. 2 Samuel 3.10 To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. The kingdom was translated. It was better. Better. Colossians 1.13 who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us unto, into the kingdom of his dear son. Even the very word translate came out better. Came out better. What are you saying by that, brother? Ed? I, just translate. Just translate. I'm not saying anything by that. Look at translate. Yeah, we know our Bible is translated. So do you, you think that God can make something better? Right there, the word translate proves he, he can. He, he's able to do it. Now, um, I didn't, I, we didn't really get to cover these, but I just want, maybe I can, I, we got time for one of these because I wanted to, to draw, you know, a foundation to get here, but uh, we got a little bit of time. So just, we'll do one. We'll do one. The Lord has Jeremiah dictate to Baruch another scroll after the king had burned the prior one and the words were added by God on the copy. Go to Jeremiah 36, 31. We'll try, try, try to fly through this. Um, Jeremiah 36, 31, and I'll read it to you while you turn there. And I will punish him and his seed and his servant for their iniquity. And I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah, all the evil that I have pronounced against them, but they hearkened not. So look at verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote thereon from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were what? Added, besides unto them, many like words. Can God add to a copy if he wants to? God can do it. I wouldn't suggest any of us doing it, but God can certainly add to a copy of a copy if he wanted to. So that's just, you know, that's just one. And man, let's, let's do one more, one more. 
One more. Because I told you we were going to cover these. One more. Tables of testimony were written with the finger of God. Correct? Exodus 24, verse 3. Exodus 24, verse 3. The words Moses wrote from the mouth of God were inspired and preserved. Exodus 24, verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do it. And then when you go to Exodus 24, 4, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. But the words that God spoke and wrote with his own finger were inspired and preserved. Exodus 31, 18. Now watch this. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an, an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. And then when you go to Deuteronomy 9.10, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone, written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly. But remember, in Exodus 32, 19, he broke them. And then in Exodus 34, I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. That's Exodus 34, 1. So Moses' writings were all inspired and preserved by God. How can they be? They were copies of copies. Can God preserve a copy? We, we've got... Scriptural proof for that. I mean, if you can't be convinced by the absolute truth argument, certainly let the scriptures convince you. So um, we're going to end it there, guys. Um, I hope that you know, maybe you might have changed your mind about uh, the King James Bible if you're swayed another direction. And just hear all the arguments. I've heard a lot of different arguments for different cases. And I know there's a, there's a controversy out there, you know, King James only versus all the other versions. You know, you got your James White guy and this and that. And I understand, I understand all that. But would you be persuaded not by just arguments that you see on debates or on, or on news or whatever? And read your Bible and let the Bible convince you of which way to go. Let God persuade you according to the Word of God. Okay, so um, thank you guys uh, just for, for, you know, listening in on that. And uh, let's go ahead and close out with prayer. Dear Father God, we just thank you for your pure, inspired, preserved word. Thank you for this good old King James Bible. I pray that people be persuaded in their minds concerning the scriptures, not just some random thing that I said, um, just believe the King James Bible like maybe some people give arguments for. But Father, that they would be persuaded through the scriptures themselves. And Father, we just thank you for this word that we can uh, change our lives with it, not change it, but let the Bible change us, and we'll just give you all the glory and praise. Uh, thank you for everybody showing up here tonight, and, uh, and just for their sincerity to learn the Word of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.